what we wanted to do, James and I, and our three esteemed panellists, is, is, is have um, a chat, first of all, this morning for an hour around the practice of, um, I suppose, farming for nature, both practical tips and advice that you might like to share, but also ways in which that uh, advice can be shared, this whole notion of knowledge transfer, how do we get your stories out to a broader audience. And also maybe we can touch on the whole notion of researching these things that maybe you'd like to see researched and uh, um, um, uh, that would help you inform what you do that little bit better. So we're going to um, chat about that and really involve both the panel and, and the audience as well. So we kind of see you all as a really rich resource to be exploited <laughs> mercilessly today. So we want to come out of this session with uh, you know, um, good ideas, good information um, that we can take forward through Farming for Nature or through GMIT or, or, or through whatever other means we, we can. So, James, you want to, to say a few words and get well, just, just, to, just to set in context in this first session, what we want to talk about is high nature value farmland in, in practice or high nature value farming. So, first of all, maybe just to make, so that we're all on the same page as regards what we're defining as sort of high nature value farming. So, in a European context with uh, Gwen's group and the European Forum for Nature Conservation and Pastoralism in the early 1990s, they saw there was a lot of talk about uh, the, basically the environmental harm that agriculture can do and an awful lot of the regulations was about uh, essentially the divergence between environment uh, and agriculture. But we also knew in, in many, many landscapes uh, across Europe that their, their biodiversity value, their, their nature, nature value, their, their, their whole essence of the, of the landscape was very much embedded with and dependent on agriculture. And agriculture and, and farming, and, uh, or the environment and agriculture went hand in hand in these areas. So these were the areas that from an agriculture production perspective were considered marginal or difficult land. So that what we said they have a high proportion of what was called semi-natural vegetation. So grasslands and pastures that traditionally didn't get uh, high amounts of fertiliser or high amounts of inputs that might be interspersed by large areas of, of, of wetlands or traditional uh, pasture woodlands, for example, the typical examples of the Dehaces and Montados in, in the Iberian uh, Peninsula. So this, they wanted to come up with some way of actually highlighting these areas as distinct from this narrative in the early 1990s of agriculture versus the environment. So they coined this phrase, high nature value farmlands that were dependent on extensive uh, farming systems. So I think we have got very good examples here of, <coughs> in Ireland. So we have from, from, from Moy Cullen in, in Galway, in, in a Connemara landscape that is dominated by, by semi-natural vegetation, the landscape shaped by, by, by agriculture. We have the, the uplands in, in Sligo in a similar fashion, shaped and the, the landscape shaped by centuries of farming as well. And then in Tipperary, where we have got this sort of situation where we've got slightly capable of more intensive production, maybe in the past it has, but it still has retained this sort of balance between areas that have been maintained as semi-natural vegetation, but not the whole whole landscape is semi-natural uh, vegetation. But I still think, in, in Michael's context, I think you've over maybe 30% of the farm or more yeah. that is uh, semi-natural vegetation. So in these areas, they're, diff they're different than how you would manage sort of a farm that is capable of the deep, fertile soils that was capable of the degree of intensification that we saw uh, over the last maybe 40 or 50 years. It, you had to work more hand in hand with nature. And I think that's what we want to get a, a handle on. That's all that stuff isn't rewarded for in the marketplace because you can't produce the, the quantities of product but you can produce very, very high qualities of, of product. But you're also producing a huge range of, of public goods that aren't rewarded. So I think that's what we want to try and get a handle on over the whole morning session. We're moving into how we pay for this later on and how we can sort of add value to it. But in this morning session, we, I think we really want to get a handle on practically how you manage this land. And it, it's, it's as much, not as much about the, the challenges, but the joy and pride you feel in terms of managing that and, and producing the, the products you produce as well, you know? I think that's yeah. a great way to frame it. And maybe we'll start then with a panelist. Maybe would you first, Jared, just maybe tell us a bit about your farm, your farming system, and why you farm the way that you do. <coughs> because let's face it, you're all a little bit different maybe from, from the norm. So maybe to start off with that. Um, <coughs> I farm about 80 acres, about a third of it rented in from my cousin and about two thirds uh, family owned in my cullen. 
Um, I'm part-time, um, busy off-farm, so it's trying to balance that. Um, I keep probably in the region of 20 to 30 cattle, probably 10 to 12 cows at the suckler system. Um, I, I went away from the traditional breed that were there in my aunt's time, uh, Charley, and went for Belted Galloway um, about 10 to 15 years ago. Um, the land, had, the cattle probably numbers had fallen off over, over the previous 20 years, and therefore um, in certain parts of the farm, woodland um, and things had um, come on a good bit. Um, so there, there was quite a diversity. Now I suppose my two interests, I'm not from the farm originally, um, my father was from the farm, I'm from Dublin originally, um, but I'd always a huge interest in farming, a huge love of farming. I spent summer holidays down there with my grandfather, um, after my grandfather died, my aunt and my grandmother. So I had that huge immensity of love for farming, love for farmland, and love for, for cattle. Um, but I'd also uh, been away kind of from farm, I, develop, I also developed a love of nature. And I suppose the, the kind of way into, into the natural world when you weren't living on a farm growing up was through nature. Um, so I, as a child, I developed hobbies like bird watching and fishing and things. So I, I cultivated an understanding, particularly of birds. And then when I came back to the farm maybe 15 years ago, when I moved uh, down, um, I developed a greater interest in, in a lot of the other diversity on a farm. Um, so a lot of the plants, uh, identifying flowers, um, identifying butterflies, and just really beginning to understand the inter, you know, kind of get a, a greater connection to the, to, to, to the landscape. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 farming for nature, like to me, is, is for me it's a process because it, it's it's not a, it's not a definitive point. Some like the farm traditionally wouldn't necessarily, you know, there be farms. The, the farm is on two types of ground. It's on the split in the Mycullen Road heading out into Connemara. So on, on one side you have granite, the granite which is generally, you know, your kind of peaty soils then, um, which are. Are, um, are, are over, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the drainage is poor. So that kind of land in the wintertime is harder to work. And then you have the limestone of the Loch Corrib system on the other part. Um, so that's easier to work. Um, so um, you're, 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 there's a lot of different... So you have them two diversities of... of, of, of and then you have mountain as well. Um, you've, you, I, have a, I have a portion of mountain too. So the one thing I have is a lot of different types of habitats. Um, and I suppose um, it's, it's just learning how to work them. And that's a process, learning the numbers, um, learning how to work it um, for the best of, of the farm that, you're, that I'm on, um, which includes, like, I outwinter cattle generally, but it's balanced. And then, you know, because I think nature is, a, you know, is a circular system, and it's trying to figure out how you... Because if you take a bit of hay off or silage off one field, you're figuring out how you put nutrients because if you like, I'd, I, like I have used a small bit of fertilizer on, on on silage fields over the years, but this year I didn't use any, and I'm looking to move away from that. But it's still looking how you, you you're able to take grass off an area to feed cattle in the winter, um, while at the same time putting it back in when you're out wintering. If you them in a shed, you have you have your your your, your farmyard manure or whatever. So a lot of that I probably talked too much there already. Oh, right? it's very interesting, and I think like the one thing I anticipate all three of you will have in common is this notion of going away and coming back. I think you've all been on your various journeys, but maybe Bridget, to ask you as well, um, what do you farm? Describe your farm, maybe tell us. I've been there, it's amazing. Um, and why you farm the way you farm? Great. Um, all right, you can hear from my accent. I mean, I didn't go away and come back, I just came back. Um, <laughs> uh, it's always really funny when people say to me, oh, wh what's your name? And you say Bridget Murphy, and they kind of think, oh, okay. But anyway, uh, so yeah, I did. I came back in, in 1998 um, to visit my dad and my mum who had come back before. Uh, my mother handed the land to me. I'm handing it to my daughter, so I'd like to kind of say there's a proud tradition here of woman passing land on. But um, Uncle Tommy had handed it over to mum. It's been in our family. Sky and I would be the ninth and tenth generation that we know of. So straight away, I mean, I think that one of the things, the way we farm is that we understand that this land is not a commercial venture, it's not something, it's not some sort of economic product that we are exploiting or using. Straight away it's something that we are handing lovingly from one generation to another um, and hoping that we have a livelihood off of it. Now, um, 
So I inherited this sheep of flock, God love it. Uh, some of them were born in the 1980s, so you can imagine if I came in in 1998, I, seriously, you actually counted how many teeth you had in the flock rather than how many of them had broken mouths, you know? Um, <laughs> it was, yeah. But it's a sheep farm, um, and no more than Jared is saying, it's broken up over different um, land types. So there's much higher mountain, um, where I have a lot of blanket bog, a lot of wetland, um, a lot of sort of very natural pools and kind of ponds. And then it goes down into very rocky land, and then down into some lower green fields that are quite sort of, um, they're very green, but, but the ground is, is, is sort of, there's only about that much soil before you get into subsoil. It has traditionally been overgrazed. Um, Uncle Tommy and then my mom and then before I came in with age and, and, and constraints had kind of pulled most of the farming down towards the house and, and the mountain wasn't used that much. Um, so what I did was I put ponies up onto the mountain to kind of beat back the... Um, what had been emerging there over the years, a lot of woody stuff coming up. And I found that it was a really smart combination to kind of like work with the diversity of kind of species because each mouth is different and each mouth, each stomach is kind of different. They're looking for different stuff. So in mixing up what you're putting out there, um, that, that started working. Now, my, my own brain, um, I, I trained as a solicitor in South Africa. I was a do-gooder. Apartheid never sat very well with me, neither did conscription. And so I went off to university and got more of a degree in being an activist than being a lawyer, but I did, I did get qualified. Um, I worked with black communities claiming land back from apartheid. And when people were going back onto their land, the first questions you had to start looking at were livelihoods. How are people gonna make a living off a piece of land that they're just coming back to? How are people going to, to share this land, to use it together? What are their long-term kind of visions for the land? And it was quite funny because I then displaced myself to Ireland and, and land up on this piece of land and I start answering all of this for myself. Um, what are my long-term gains? How am I going to make a livelihood out of this? How am I going to use it? How do I share the mountain land, the commonage land with other people? Um, so it's been, it's been an incredible adventure kind of doing that because, as I say, I mean, when you learn to put ponies on, then I realize that, hold on a moment, people are looking at gorse as a problem, but can gorse be a solution? And then you start putting bees into it. Um, you start realizing when you have bees that you need willow. Um, in the spring because the two things that are going to save your hives coming through a winter are going to be dandelions, which are your first supply of nectar and pollen, and, and, and your willows. So all of a sudden I was going around planting willows like mad and then I kind of realized, actually, hold on a moment, the bees needed a whole kind of sequence of trees to get them to midsummer when, 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 there's, uh, when the clover's going. So all of a sudden I was running in and planting all of those and then I had to kind of deal with this whole thing of, oh, okay, is um, sycamores non-native? Should I kind of only stick with that? Should I not? And you start, so what I'm trying to get at is in practice, when you kind of like putting nature and your livelihoods and how those two are going to interact together, you start exploring stuff. And this is one of the things I just loved about becoming a farmer, is that you make a plan. You wake up, you look around, you figure out what's missing, and you make a plan. Often there's no rule book, nobody's written the rule book yet. I mean, you were able to kind of go out and learn about permaculture and whatever and whatever, but. I started making contraptions and, you know what I mean? It, it, and, and so there's this adventure, there's this amazing adventure, but there you go, I'm, I'm kind of like, I have the sheep farm, I have, um, as I say, the ponies, I'm on bees at the moment, and what I really want to get into, and it was what somebody touched on yesterday, um, is seeds. I mean, we're all talking about multi-species swords, we're all talking about this transition, we're talking about planting more trees, and we're importing all of this stuff. It's non-native seed. It's not acclimatized to our area. There's the whole risk of, and we saw this with ash dieback, disease coming in. We need to kind of have local seeds. We need to have local trees. We need to have local tree nurseries. And, and that's kind of where my farm is orientating to at the moment, um, so is, is looking at seeds. And, to, to, yeah. 
Uh, sorry to cut across here, Bridget. Uh, we'll move to Michael now, but you're both kind of responding almost to the needs of the land, the particular circumstances of the land, yeah. um, rather than imposing yourselves and upon those, it. And those for us are the market. Mm. I mean, the market for other people might be an export market of cattle, but for us, our market is what is, what is, what is on our land and what's best for our land and what's needed by the, for the land. So, Michael, you, you've got quite a journey to share as well, and again, I've been privileged to see your amazing farm, yeah. something which is very, very different from the others, but tell us a little bit about your farming system and, again, um, your journey to Yeah, it. maybe I'll start by saying that I was brought up down the road in Ennis Diamond, so I'm not far away from home, and I spent about 10 or 12 years travelling around the world because that's what we did in, in the 60s and the early 70s, and, uh, and when I was in, sitting in North Queensland, my uncle passed away, <clears throat> unfortunate for him and fortunate for me, and uh, I decided I'd come home and have a look. So I came back to a very derelict farm. It hadn't been worked since, there was 100 acres there, but it hadn't been worked since the Second World War. So if you can imagine, there were trees growing through the, the shed roofs. Um, there were no gates, no, no nothing, no fences, no anything, but it was a magnificent wilderness. And I came back with a, an Australian artist from, who was born in Hungary. And she just wanted to uh, close the one gate we had and just live there. So I spent the first 10 years um, alternating between her ideas of, of uh, perfect bliss and my poor attempts to try and bring some order to what, what was mostly chaos. But the farm itself is uh, 100 acres. Um, there are many different habitats. I'm on the river shore. So there are wetlands, which we call the inches, because they get flooded throughout the winter. Uh, there's what's termed locally as bog land, but it's actually heavy, heavily wet grassland. Uh, it's, it's an old glacial till that has laid down very, very uh, shallow soil. So we have this acid on alkaline soil. And then we have a good bit of uh, woodland, and uh, we have about 40, 45 adjusted acres. So when I came first, we, I knew nothing about farming. I had never been, I'd been on this farm that I, that I now live on, but I had never done any farming. But in some ways, it gave me an advantage in the sense that when people did things, I said, well, why do you do that? And for the most part, I was finding people didn't know why they did it. They did it because their fathers did it or because the Chagas, had, well, then it was the Forest Farbaha advised them to do it. But they didn't really have an opinion on what they were doing. Um, so I kind of realized very early on that I was on my own. So I was advised that I'd need about 70,000 to put the farm together. So I went and bought a couple of calves and got started. And uh, slowly but surely, we developed a, a horse venture. Somebody came and had horses on my farm and, and uh, in payment, he gave me a couple of horses. So I bred a stallion and I built a house uh, because my house burnt down. My, my uh, ancestors didn't like the carry on. And uh, I pulled down their, their building and altered its position, brought it into the middle of the farm. Um, and I developed this horse venture and I sold horses to England and we sold beef. So in the beginning I started with, with Angus and got a little herd going. And in those days, that was back in the early 80s, there wasn't anybody interested in organic. We were organic from, from 1981. But I went to the universities and found that the, uh, the academics were the ones that understood about, about food and so forth. So I had consumer groups in all the universities in Ireland, so in UL, in uh, UCD. So I would arrive up at the car park and have 15 bags of, of, of meat and go home with 1,500 pounds, which was just magnificent. Um, it was a shoestring operation. And um, I married this wonderful woman <laughs> who changed it from a shoestring operation into some kind of a farm and uh, taught, me, taught me a little bit of organization. And uh, over the years, I've learned that the most important thing about, about land is when you're not sure, do nothing. Do nothing. Just wait. And sure as hell, the answer will come to you. If you have the patience, over the years I have found time and time again that when I have a problem, any kind of problem, whether it be electrical, whether it be mechanical, whether, whatever it is, if I have the time to stand back and wait, the answer will, will appear. And the most simple solutions 
often are the ones that work. Um, I've never since, I think probably 19, since reps began, <laughs> I have never had a money problem. Money is, is, is an idea, you know, that whole idea is, is, is what we have concocted in our heads, you know. I mean, if you set your life according to what you want to do, and you do it with the passion and the love, the money side of it just finds its own way of, and I have found that constantly when I was building my house, I knew nothing about building a house. I built a six-sided uh, thatched stone house. I found that fortune favors the brave. You just get in there and people are attracted to a lunatic. <laughs> They're attracted to something. I've had instances where, for instance, I came to the windowsills and the builder said to me, where will the windows go? And I said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> so I realized I needed windowsills. So I went down to, I saw, where do you get, where do you get nice uh, limestone? So I went down to a quarry down in Clare. And when I got there, I realized it was a, a bank holiday. But I went to see the man anyway, and he was so blown away with this idiot <laughs> that didn't even realize it was a bank holiday that he opened his quarry, he cut all my windowsills for me, and as an added bonus, he packed them because he didn't have wood with enough stone for me to make my mantelpieces and other little features in, in the house. And that kind of, that kind of fortune has, has followed me in, in everything that I've done. And as far as the farm is concerned, yeah, it's, it's, um, it, supports, it supports me wholeheartedly. And that's all I have to say about it. So, so just so I get, for, get from, from all, all your stories that it's, a lot of it's about reading the land, un understanding it. And I suppose a lot of it too, as you say there, you have the... You put in the time, you have the time to do this. And I suppose I'm teaching a lot of ag students now that come from, from Mount Bellew for the first two years, come into us in, in, in third year, you know. And I think often with the students, they feel like they, they should be able to find something in practice. They have straight away, what should I do with my farm? I have this land, what can I do? How can I make the income now? I need to, you know, they have a different expectation to a certain extent on a standard of life. And it's very easy for them to actually get the standard information about uh, reseeding uh, grass 10 from 10, you know, increasing the, uh, the numbers. And given the area we're situated in, I know when I try and say that you have to look at the land and that's not going to be applicable to the vast majority of your farm settings, or at least a proportion of your, of your farm setting. So if you had then people coming to you now in a practical, uh, practical terms, and they could see their farm in, uh, in your farms, because I, I know I have students in front of us on a, on a regular basis, and young people who have all your types of, of land, have your possibilities as well. But how, would you, how would you in practice sort of communicate in, in, that with in them? In answer to that, yeah. James, I've had UL students that have come yeah. to me every year yeah. with uh, contrasts of, uh, he, he does the orchards down in Care, yeah. and I just tell them my story, and he has said constantly that it has caused the most controversy in, in the follow-up conversations. Yeah. Um, when people see that there is such a thing as a lifestyle in farming, that there is an option, that here's somebody who has actually done it, it starts that, that mechanism. Yeah. So that's what I would say about that. And I think that's what's, what's clear. We need them to see... This, these examples, these practical examples that these things are, are possible. So, and I think one thing is, often I think as well of this, you, uh, it was mentioned again yesterday that you have to be, uh, basically you can't be green when you're in the red, you know? So but I think with all your things, you, you can carve out a life where by going green, knowing the land, understanding it, you can have a, have a, have a living as well. But I think, Ollie, you're full time on the farm. Yes. You're, you're full-time as well, and you're part-time. And it's, it's, I suppose, particularly too, with, it's this contrast between full-time and part-time and how you manage the time as well in that and how you divide up your time practically. Yeah, yeah it is, but I'd, I'd like to swing back to just yeah. something you were touching on there. It's about finding value. Mm. And we, t we even talk about the high nature value. You know, we, we, we're looking for the value in something. And at the moment, our, the way we look at value and the, 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 the tools we use to measure value, I think, need to come under a bit of scrutiny. What Michael's saying is really, really true. Living a life true to yourself, living a life of um, 
exploring just having enough, not needing to have more and more and more. But, you know, as a parent, you, you look at your kid and you say to it, just be who you are. You know, I mean, at least get a sense of who you are as you go out into the world, because if you know yourself, you can kind of deal with a whole lot of stuff. When we take our land, we need to start with what is there, what, what it is, what its nature is, rather than, you know, a lot of the time with the ag colleges, they talk about grazing platforms. Um, it, 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 that, that's a construct. You know what I mean? Everybody aspires then, all right, if I'm going to have cattle or dairy, I need X many grazing platforms, they need to produce this and this and this. But what they're not looking at is, what is the nature of what's sitting underneath? It is never going to become that unless you actually literally destroy it to get that. So I think, I think right away from the beginning is, understand who you are and understand what your land is and then find the value in it. And the value could be something completely different to how many liters of milk or kilograms of meat go out the farm gate. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's what you're touching on there with the, the, the university students. Learning to kind of like put a different value to different types of ecosystems is really important. Yeah. Um, I'd say two things. One, the system as it, as it is currently, uh, the productivity system across, across farming is, is driving at a rate. It's like going down the motorway at 150 kilometers an hour. It's going too fast. And obviously climate change is the, is, is the, is the dominant piece that's come into the, into the headlights. And farming nationally is, is, struggling to see, is struggling now because they see the economics that have allowed them to drive at 150 kilometers an hour are, are struggling to, to, you know, that they're going to have to, the system is going to have to slow down because it can't cope at that speed. Climate change, we don't talk as much about biodiversity crisis, that's not as critical, it's not felt as critical to us as a species, but climate change is center stage in the economic narrative of the globe and therefore that's coming center stage. So that's something that the system that's built and the system of productivity that they're driving into, they, they, they need to understand that that's, that model needs to shift. There needs to be a pulling back and how you come back into a more nature-friendly way, um, but there's a, there's a journey back from, from the level of, of productivity. The other piece is, I think, if you're brought up in a, in a farm in Tipperary or if you're brought up on a farm even in East Galway and places, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a farm that you can work full time on, it's a farm that's capable of delivering an income. You have to, the, the, there's, a, there's a group philosophy there, you're brought up in a culture, no more than any of us in a particular culture. If we associate with people that are like-minded, we find it easy to be ourselves. If we're, if we're associating with it, so if you're in a productivity system, if you're down at the mart and you're doing something different, like multi-species swords have come into play in the narrative even of dairy farming in the last couple of years now as a way of cutting down on nitrogen. So that's something that's coming a bit centre stage. But if you were talking that and talking, talking plantains in your, in your mix and everything there, or, you know, because uh, you, you know, most dairy farms run that the clover can't even survive, it's, dri it's driving at such a rate that the clover can't even get a hold. So that kind of thing, you're down at the mart, it's, 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 I'm thinking of men, because it's often men, and men's ego is often tied up in their, in, within the group think, that the, the ability to think outside that box is, is important and the ability to kind of really understand yourself as an individual and be, be able to, to do something different, be able to stand outside the crowd and actually voice an opinion that's contrary to the crowd is, is, is an important thing in, in students, in, in universities and how the, the education is. Because you're going against everything. You're going against Chagas for the last yeah. 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, I think, I found anyway, as I said, when I looked at these people, they really didn't know why they were doing it. I mean, a lot of people, the academics, are there because they have to be and because they have to push an agenda. And, you know, for a lot of them, it's the party line. But for anybody who stands aside, I mean, everybody, everybody here has an opinion. And if you nurture that opinion, and I think that's a very important process to actually have the faith in yourself. When I was a child, I was exposed to a lot of uh, intuitive thinking. Uh, in Clare and so forth, in Galway. I was born in Galway. And I found that a, a, a mirror or an echo in, in the Aboriginal people in, in Central Australia. And we've lost that connection to a, a great degree. But all of us still feel it. It's that voice in your head that says, don't do that, and you do it anyway. 
And then you say, I should listen to that voice. And when you actually do, you don't actually get the result because you prevent the thing from happening. Do you sort of know what I'm talking about? We do, and I think it's, it's, we're going to go to the, the, the audience now, so get your questions ready, because we'd love to hear from you. But I, uh, it's a very interesting conversation. But the question is, how, how, how do you kind of teach then? How do you, because it's, you're, what you're saying is you're responding to your circumstances and to your values and to the piece of land that you have. How can you teach that? How can, so my question to you, maybe briefly, if you can, is where do you get your information? Um, it's okay to kind of to stand back, but where do you get the information which informs what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it all intuitive? Do you ask other farmers? Where do you get your information from? Um, I suppose from a, from a high nature value, like to be an element, for me there's an element of intuition in the context I'm aware of nature. I'm aware of the context. Like driving down here today, coming down through, like I mentioned two things. Two things this morning early, the number of red wing going over. So red wing are mm. a type of thrush that comes in from Scandinavia and Iceland. I saw my first one this, win this autumn, maybe two or three weeks ago. Big numbers going over this morning. So it's observing nature. It's observing the movements, whether it's the sun, whether it's all that. Driving down here between Clare and Bridge and Kilcolgan. A white egret, we're familiar with the white egrets now in the last 30 years, generally little egret. Their numbers have, po have gone up. They're moving in. They see change in climate that maybe not even at an intuitive level humans are aware of. But that wasn't a little egret I saw. It was a great white egret. It was a heavier flight. So there's a bird that's only come in in the last few years. Again, a, prod a bird that is moving with the environment. It's moving with nature. It's, see it's feeling. We don't feel it. Human beings have, are, are living more up in the head. So intuitively, we don't feel nature as much. Our older people in the past, out and particularly out in the west of Ireland, were very intuitive in the context of nature. They really understood nature. They were living with nature all the time. Um, as a society, and it's not just farming, we've moved away, and probably even less so far, uh, in, in urban societies have moved away from farming. Where do you get it? I think, I think there has to be responsibility on the agricultural colleges to, to change the narrative, to change the narrative, because they are the drivers, Chagas and the educational bodies are the drivers of the broad sway of, of, of information that farmers receive. And it's only by changing that then, because farmers inherently, you're in a mart, you're in, a, you're in an environment with other farmers, it's, it's very much a kind of a, a boys club um, and, 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 and a group think. Where I got my information, I suppose, Twitter was an enormous uh, uh, view out into the wider world. It's a great place for information. Obviously, there's a lot of negative things said about it at times, but it's a great place for information. But there's so much now on the internet uh, that can bring a knowledge in, for, say, for me. Um, for others, like, because I'd mix, I might go to my ag advisor, and he, a big client base, you know, both sides of Galway City. Um, I don't know. I think it has to come back to just the policy, at a policy level, there has to be a drive, as is happening currently in CAP, and, and you'll see the big pushback from the IFA and bodies like that to try and hold, uh, hold, hold the ground. But I think that's, that's where it has to happen. To and Bridget, what, what would you think, particularly when you think about the, the sort of the mass audience, maybe the, the, the group of farmers kind of in the middle who aren't quite sure which way to go, where, where can they get their information if they want to farm in a more sustainable way, and where do you get yours? Okay, I mean, I... Obviously, in, in, in the beginning, I mean, I, I, I looked at books and, and, and the early internet, but what I've found more and more over the last, I'd say, 10 years is that older farmers and other farmers are doing exactly what Jared is talking about. They're observing, and they've been observing, and they're tweaking, and they're trying, and they're looking. And if you start reaching out, and I did, I mean, I stumbled across, there's, there's somebody sitting here, Tommy Early, um, at the time when I was having a look at, at wetlands and, and it was for the, for the upland farmers. And you come across this man who's, who's busy re-wetting his, 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 his land. And not only that, he's managed to kind of get a, a, a fellow in from Queen's University and he's kind of like set it up. And if you look at it, Tommy is your average kind of farmer who's just gone off gotten into it, and he's leading the research at this point, or at least leading the, the on-the-ground kind of stuff. So I realized that actually to sit down with other farmers and to find out what they know, and to find out and start sharing that, and let farmers teach each other, because it was mentioned again yesterday, you know, you can tell people to, to do a whole bunch of stuff, 
but actually it's leaning over that farm gate or leaning over the, the, the rail at the mart when the one fella says to the other fella, ah, Jesus, have you tried one of those things on the tail for when, you know, she's due to carve? And some, ah, it was a great idea. And then they'll kind of try it. But if the rep comes around to you and says that they think this is a great idea, the farmer goes, yeah, 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 thank you. So uh, Talif Bio, the, the farm organization I'm with at the moment, is, is um, getting ready to, to launch a soil biodiversity um, EIP. And what we did was we built the whole lot off of what farmers know and what farmers can actually teach each other. And it wasn't being arrogant not to bring in Chagas or, or any of the departments to educate us. What we wanted to do was find out how much we knew ourselves and how we could actually educate ourselves and teach each other. And I think that's, that's a really, really critical thing. Putting the, the, the desire back in people to go and learn rather than being taught. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on teaching us stuff, but actually us learning is a very different process. Mm, completely different. Michael, do you want to add anything before um, we go through? Not the really. I think I agree with... Uh, probably, for me, probably the organic community. Uh, you know, they were the people who were doing something similar to what I was doing, or the permaculture people. Uh, that kind of idea. Okay. So let's maybe go to the, um, to the, the audience here. This man in front, starting off. And while I agree with everything that was said there, um, as a devil's advocate, um, uh, and to kind of stand in for the people that you're talking about who are outside the room, um, the concern for me is that because of the need for food, number one, and because all these other farmers that you described there uh, will, will say to me, you know, you're mad in the head because uh, the more land I have and the more cattle I keep, the more money I make. I have to pay for the big tractor. I have to pay my mortgage. I have to pay for the land I bought. And then you have the Trump-type thinking where, you know, China's out there and it's a market we have to take on. Uh, the, the dairy farms south of me around the Tlown area are growing by the day. The numbers of cattle there, numbers of dairy cows, the amount of reseeding that's taking place on traditional pastures there mm. um, and, 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 and if I go to the mart and I say to those people uh, no you're mad in the head you should be copying what I'm doing um, then the debate takes off from there and, and, it's, <laughs> and it's, not it's not resolving do you understand we can yeah. say all we like what, what, what we like here but you have the Trump type thinking and I was just wondering how uh, we're going to deal with that. And the other point is that maybe we should split in two, that it should be a farming for nature division as against the people who, who need to produce the food for the masses. I think, I, think, I think it's a myth, this idea of food for the masses. It's a total myth. What do we produce in Ireland? We produce beef and milk in huge quantities. Who do we sell it to? Chinese babies that should be breastfed, African babies that should be breastfed. Um, our beef goes into a commodity market. Years and years ago, we suggested that there be uh, what they, they call now Origin Green, this, this half-baked idea. The idea of, of Ireland as an organic country. We're perfectly situated to do that kind of thing. But that choice was not, was not made. Now, I agree with what, what the gentleman is saying. Uh, there, are, there is a whole group of people that want to go like hell and they want to make it into such a business. And that's what it has become. Uh, how that's going to play out, I think Bridget would probably explain to you better than I could. But I mean, we're heading down the road at 150 miles an hour. And uh, the crash for a lot of those people, unfortunately, is a lot closer than they, than they think. So I really think that we're, we're, we're going to be pushed back on the resources that are almost gone in the country in the not too distant future. But I really think the, the, the idea of us producing food for the world needs to be exploded because we're not doing that. And I think it's really important to kind of ask that question, all right, it's important to feed people, but it how do you feed people and what do you feed people? Because, I mean, I showed my daughter something on, on, on YouTube the other day, 
great YouTube uh, education channel. Um, <laughs> that uh, I think it's I think it's entitled "How the World Got Obese." It was a study done in 2014. Um, between 1975 and 2014, but it's one of these maps that sort of, you know, um, it's an animated kind of map. And she was horrified at the end of it because you could see that from the time when fast food started appearing in our supermarkets, when convenience food arrived, when convenience food was, was where the, it, the world was at for housewife, this is great, we're going to make your life easier. People's health kind of outcomes went in the opposite direction. People these days are kind of suffering with diabetes and obesity and heart conditions and whatever. Yeah, we're feeding people, but what are we feeding them? So, and then the question is, once again, how are we going about doing it? Because if we're doing it in such a way that we're destroying the actual foundation, the living soil, the land, what, what use was that food anyway? So I think those are two big questions that need to be asked. How are we feeding people? What are we feeding them? And as you say, to burst that bubble, start feeding locally first. Start feeding good, healthy, nutrient-dense food. Start with feeding ourselves, and then kind of look out. And, and, and again, yeah, I mean, okay, there's, there's, there's a market there in China to kind of send beef into. But I mean, do the Chinese really, really kind of need to to, to, it's being marketed anyway as welcome to, to a Western diet, welcome to kind of being a first world rich person. This is not the narrative that needs to be going out when it needs to, when we're talking about feeding people. So I think we really need to challenge how we understand feeding people. We need to kind of shift away from this idea of food security, shift it more to food sovereignty if people are... Um, aware of that kind of concept where where people, communities, and, and countries can start deciding their own agricultural policy for themselves. We are in this country shoehorned into an export market of milk and beef. Really, nothing else is paid for under our common agricultural policy. The rest is all just a couple of little sort of decorations on the side. But we fundamentally need to kind of reassess how we feed people and what we feed them. Yeah, I, I, your name is covered there, but I, I totally agree with you. I think I'm probably on the same narrative there when I was talking uh, a while ago. Um, they're all. I, I think the only thing that will change the masses, in, in, uh, and I don't want really to use the word masses because I, I, I don't think farmers don't sit outside society. Uh, the most product, like productivity, is something that's is in the hu is in the human being the drive to be productive. I think it's in our evolution. Um, and it's very much in the corporate world, um, the world that many people live in. Um, it's it's all about productivity. Um, price, you look at the price people are willing to pay, they're willing to pay for a chicken or anything like, you know, if somebody said it's 20 euro for the chicken, you know, other than a very small group of people that are doing all right money-wise for themselves, most people will go for the, the cheaper chicken. So there's this huge... Uh, societal issues in wrapped up in in, in the whole equation, and farming at, at a productivity level is only just feeding into that same psyche, that same and the corporate world because the, the farmers don't see themselves as environmentalists. They don't see themselves as and I, again I'm I'm splitting and I shouldn't be splitting um, us and them. Um, it's it's. The, the, I think the only thing that and that will change that is what I said before is, is policy. That policy um, will 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 inevitably force a change of 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 of, uh, of how things are done. I don't know if this kind of. I think there will be a lot of more rewilding because unless people have a love of land, like the three of us on the stage. Um, the level of input, particularly if you're part-time, required to keep going and to keep doing and to keep things and checking. Like, I have neighbours that got a dog there recently and they told me they gave the dog away again. He was too much trouble. Um, if you're out checking cattle morning and evening, like I'm sitting at home now, but in the past I would have been on the road all the time. Um, but I'm out checking cattle first thing in the morning. I have to check the cattle. I to, you know, I have a cow there this morning before I left there now. A heifer late going in calf. She's looking like she might be sick to calf. So I have to check her before I go. It's all them responsibilities, a huge amount of responsibilities on anyone that keeps cattle, keeps land. Um, the, um, but the, 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 the whole biz I think the, the dairy farming and a, a lot of farming is running at too high. It's running too fast. And that is impacting then. So you can't, we can't run, we can't run at that, at that speed because it does impact water in them areas. It does impact, um, 
you know, it does impact nature. Like, nature is gone from a lot of the landscape. I mean, people might look and think a hedgerow has four different or five <coughs> different species of trees in it. But there's no real, you know, you look at the change. I mean, there are cha positive changes. I mean, I look at, I, I bought a, a copy of the Breeding Atlas of Birds there in Charlie Burns there a couple of weeks ago. And you look at a bird like Blackcap, and you look at the distribution of Blackcap in that survey in 1968 to 1972, and they were confined to the east of the country. Now if I go for my walk in my Cullen for about a, for an hour's lunchtime walk or whatever, I go for a walk around, this, and it's, a, it's, it's an area with built-up houses. I probably get 10 pairs of Blackcap in the summer. So there are positive changes around wood land and things around wooded habitats that things are improving um, but uh, the kind of farmland birds then we've moved into a more monocultural type play so therefore kind of select species things like yellow hammer uh, you know when I was a child or small little bird they're associated with tillage they're confined to the southeast and the east of the country now because that's where tillage is going if you if you get rid of tillage in Ireland like the pressure that's on now say with fertilizer prices and things tillage will go might if that went by the wayside birds like yellow hammer will go the way a corn bun thing which was another bird that was associated with tillage and mixed farming of, of the 1960s and 50s out on the west coast and all a lot of so the whole interplay of of how we farm but I think we all it's not just about farmers because farmers under, feel under a lot of pressure they feel like there's an urban agenda driving the system that's happy to purchase beef in from Brazil where rainforests are cut down and and and, and soya is, is and their high, high productivity systems if we allow beef in in that arena at the demands of, of beef in Ireland then we, we're not really in a joined up thinking we're not really at a, at, a, at, a, at a thinking at a planetary level. Okay, I think Brent, just some of the answer to that question was in what you said earlier on in terms of look and understand, first of all. And I don't think we need to split into have a twin track uh, 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 approach. I think that would be, be wrong because er every farm has a nature value. Every farm has a, can supply services for water and carbon. Every farm has a capacity for food production. But I think it's a matter of looking and understanding the particular parcels of land that you have and what its capacity is. And some will have higher capacity for food and fibre, some will have higher capacity for, for other services. But in terms of the, the, the policy side of things and what's driving this, and I think we really see the backlash and when we're seeing this policy change uh, at the moment, no farm is viable in, in Ireland, except a few dairy farms, without the subsidies, you know? So, it is. so in terms of this myth of uh, commercial farms in Ireland, you know, there's very, very few that, that they're all, it's all subsidy driven. So it's a policy that, that, that drives this, you know. So again, I think it's if the policy takes a step back and facilitates and has the flexibility to allow people to look and understand and the freedom to farm the land they have themselves, we will get a lot of the answers that, that require. So, it is. so I think that's part of it. But... Uh, I think we'll go back to the question yeah, of the audience, and, but I think, this, and, I think this is a very important debate about splitting into different sides. And I think what I got from me in the first round was look and understand, and then it be the system enabling that. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's a really great question because it thinks about the, the broader audience out with the room, but we're going to come to speak about paying yeah. for ecosystem services in the next session, so maybe we'll try and stick with the notion of... Um, the practice and the knowledge transfer and where you get ideas and information from. Other questions here? Yeah. Lucy's got the mic. Sean. Oh, beside Sean. Yeah. I'm wondering how do we convince our farmers that they're producing food rather than commodities? Two weeks ago, I had 42 students, fourth year um, ag students from MUC in Tralee, and of the 42 of them, there was only six of them, the eight produce came off their own farm. So they are obviously producing stuff, they're going through a farming system, but they're so disconnected from the land and the farm, they don't see what they're doing as producing food. So out of 42 of them, only six of them ate, either drank their own milk or ate their own beef. So they produced this as a commodity, shipped it out as an economic unit, and then had to go and spend money to go and buy an imported version coming back in. So how do we reconnect our farmers with understanding this food they're producing for people as opposed to commodity for export? That's a really good question. Anybody want to, to respond to that? I'm actually surprised even that six out of the 42 had, to be honest with you. But yeah. Michael, I think you're gearing up to... No, I'm just... No. I, I think the... Sorry, uh, Bridget. The, the... Yeah. You know, it's like... If you, it's like we're up against the wall of the problem. You know? And I think it's all part of the speed and the, the collision that, that we're heading towards. And that narrative just needs to change. We need to start, you know, I mean, those people that are doing, and any time I've come across them, the stress factors 
that when you factor that into their lives and so forth, the amount of damage that it's doing to them is horrendous. And very few people are able to cope with that. Now, there are individuals I have met who, who can cope with, with huge outlay of, of loans, etc. But the average person who's following that kind of guideline is not able for that kind of life. And we're seeing that in our, in, in our health outcomes in, in the country at the moment. Um, it stresses something we've only begun to understand. And probably it's much more understood in other countries and they have kind of pulled away from, uh, from the kind of agriculture that we're heading into. And we have an insatiable, an insatiable desire for money and success. It's part of our Celtic background. It's, it's in our DNA, as, as Gerard would, would, would say. But it can be directed in whatever way. I mean, we are being directed at present. And I mean, if the, if the direction was in a, in a different way, if we were to create a model of a stress-free, uh, family-orientated lifestyle world, those people who are now heading for the 900 cows and so forth would head in a different direction just as easily. But how that change is going to be brought about is, is for the next generation. I think in part as well, I think we have to change our definitions. I mean, James, you mentioned there about how many f farms are viable. The definition of a viable farm when Chuggis is doing those reports is based not on how many kids you reared, how well they kind of ate, whether you managed to put them through school, whether you're managing to kind of like bring in a certain amount level of income. A farm is measured viable or not if you can afford to hire or farm labor. So right from the very beginning, every single family farm in Ireland that works with family labor is unviable. Regardless of whether you actually delivered, regardless of whether you actually eat well, raised your kids well, live in a warm, comfortable dwelling. Do you know what I mean? So the, the, the definitions, the metrics that we are measuring things by are wrong. Every family farm in this country is unviable by definition. That's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. This nation is where it's at because of the family farm. So it's time to change. You know, you're talking about changing the policy, but the policy starts straight away by taking, throwing away the one ruler and replacing it with another ruler. Okay, as an metric ruler. Let's go to Sean for a question. Sean. Thank you, uh, Brendan. Um, I suppose, in a way, I was probably wowed recent, in, in recent times when I heard that, you know what, as I sit before you here, I'm actually more microbial than I am human. Do you think that we need to get that message uh, in true knowledge transfer that it is the biology that matters? Yeah, and, 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 and the biology will get you the nutrient density food and healthy societies. So that's my question. I think, Sean, I think at, at the forefront of science, they are understanding that. Um, I think our, our, our foremost scientists do believe, I mean, now we understand that we're, are we bacteria or are we fungus? You know, that kind of level of understanding is increasing, but it's at the, the very zenith of science, and it takes quite a while for that to filter down. But I think it's coming. I think all of those things are coming. I think the, the mycelium and, and, and that whole idea of what's the vast world that's underneath us we're beginning to understand that it's far, far greater than the world above the ground. So I think that's a process, and I think it's, it's, it's on the way, like my jacket. I, I, don't know, I don't know what the answer to that is, because I think in, in the past, people realized that the old dust to dust and dust you shall return. Um, so there was a great sense of our organicness our, uh, and the fact that when we, when we die, we, uh, we merge back into the, uh, unless there's a soul or whatever, the head's off in another direction. So I don't know. I think there will be increasingly things like the microbiome and that type of thing in the context of disease, I think, is, and the understanding that the, you know, her, the, the bacteria in our GI tract play in, in, in the context of disease will increase and, 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 and scientific rigor will examine that and, 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 and come up with answers. Um, but I don't know, I, I think, um, I, I, I don't think, I think, we're, I think it's, it's, we're dealing with the bigger picture and, and there are philosophical, much bigger philosophical issues. Western society, the pace, profit, all them things moving from a profit to a kind of a circular type system of, 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 of value because 
society likes the flashy things. They like they, they like the the new clothes. They like the the new car. They like the the house, and all of that is 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 monetary driven. Um, so I don't know. They're all philosophical and, and and larger economic questions beyond my capacity to figure out. Um, and farming is just sitting in the middle of them um, at a human level. Then just in the con in the context of our. Or, 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 or us as an organism. Um, I mean, nature might figure us out sometime in the future, all right, and uh, deal with us appropriately, you know? Just as a scientist on that one, on the, the, the microbiome, some of the understanding of that, like, you know, been in foresight studies uh, that Chagas organized uh, on this sort of stuff, and it was all about uh, the gut microbiome for, for the cow, you know? But the discussion uh, quickly went around to, how can we fix the gut microbiome that we can carry on with production and not uh, have the metagenic bacteria producing the methane? So I think there is, you know, there can be scientific understanding, but I think it's the big thing is then how the scientific understanding is brought to bear on the, on, on the practice. Now that's there, it went off on a tangent and around that table, as you can imagine, about whether you can stop biology like, you know, but there was, you know, so, some, of the, some of the top scientists who are embedded in this production model saw that as understanding of the microbiome as an opportunity to switch off methanogenesis in the, 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 the gut of the cow to actually present methane. So there might be, and this is where all the, the technology is trying to come in terms of the, the seaweed as well, you know, but that looking for this big silver bullet while we're all, <laughs> what if you look, while the scientist sticks his head up from the microscope, everything is burnt and doing <laughs> <laughs> flames behind them, you know. But, but there is, this is the thing I worry sometimes too. This is why I think these conversations are so important, is that we cannot be led by the science. Science has to serve and answer the questions that society needs, and we come together in that in the conversation. You know, I think that's, uh, that's, that's very important. Just, that, that links back to just thought in my mind as you cross. I think it's a good one. We have, we have time maybe for one, one or two more questions. Um, we'll go to Parik and then uh, Liam. So, Parik here. I just... We'll say if you just sit as a kind of a, a farmer hat on and we listen to the conversation, you know, and we hear all the farms aren't viable, you know, and then we think, well, we stop doing what we're doing or we change and we move back from the farm and, and then we hear all the cap money is going to go there. So we take that away. So we make them less viable again. And we look at succession and we look at passing on farms and we're looking at encouraging people and then we hear that our population is going to be so many more billion by 2050 and it's very confusing <laughs> confusing is the word yeah <laughs> you know and i'm not sure no matter how much we talk about it, that we're going to get so i think that if we kind of if we look at our farm for nature and our balance i think if we use more of a balanced word within farming for nature and kind of get a lot more people, because what's going to happen is the smaller farms are going out. If the farming is so unviable, how come land has gone up by about 25% in the last year and a half? Because you have all your industries now, and the whole thing is about, going to be about carbon farming. And you're looking at all big industry looking to, and you're going to come looking at value and carbon credits, and we're going to be looking at soils, and we're going to be looking at hedgerows, and we're going to be looking at so many more things. And it's going, to, you know, that farming mightn't be viable, but the land is viable, because it's the only thing we have that we're all able to have to live off. And it's looking like, I, I'm confused as well with all this carbon credit, because we have all this carbon credit. We're not doing any more to store any more of it. Do you know what I'm saying? So just by saying it's carbon credit, we're only recognizing of what has been keeping the planet going. But by people being able to buy it up, it just allows them to go on and, and multiply what they're doing industrially. So I think we've got to broaden the, the whole thing and try and get balance in. And we've got to try and get everyone to do a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know. we'll, we'll go to Liam and then we'll maybe get some panel responses and maybe take a third question before we... Hello, are you? Very good discussion panel. And I, no, I'm, I'm from Roscommon, it's the name of this man here and I'm from South Roscommon. And from our, our farm, the way we farm in our area, and I can only talk about, we farm from passion. It's more and common sense, to get me to know. So all the policies that roll in on top of us, like in our region, I mean, to get me to know, like reps, I, I just give our perspective. When reps was introduced in our area, okay, we looked around. Now, 
Our land, it's all rocks to get them, you know. And we knew if we cleared that, we'd have only 804. So we didn't engage because the neighbours were clearing before them for, for the environmental policy. So what I'm saying is, like, common sense is a big thing that's been kind of left out of the equation. Like, you're saying, like, it's really common sense. And, like, our forefathers that went before us, they realised that land and how to farm it to get me to know. It's the, in the last few generations that has been really been eroded in a rapid f f function, do you get me? Because, for, like, we, like, we were doing it okay, for, and now, now suddenly we're in a real tangent, do you get me? So I think if we looked at what people did, like, say, uh, say our forefathers, they had a better understanding of that land. And that man there, common sense is what you're saying, and that's what we're missing in the con conversation. Pure common sense. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Liam. Any last um, question from the audience before we go back to the panel? And Yeah, Dennis. Um, hi, thanks. Um, I suppose generally with farmers, if you want them to do anything, it's either a carrot or a stick. Um, the farming for nature is good. It's a good road to be on. Um, I suppose policy over the years got us to essentially the problem was there due to policy, and this is where the burn program came out of. Farm for Nature is there. It's, it's a pioneer. It's, it's, it's good that people see, actually, there is an alternative than the following the main, you know, profit-driven thing. It would be interesting to see going down the road. We have a lot of knowledge transfer. Today is a knowledge transfer. Um, knowledge transfer is going to be there for most farmers going forward, and it's a great thing. Discussion groups, even meeting in the pub every day is a knowledge transfer. But um, it'll be interesting if Chagas obviously do their profit monitors and they do their signpost farms and things like that. Maybe it's an area that this is in the EAP or whatever, the farm for nature should be profit monitors, and they should be looking at. But the measurement of what should be in the carrot is not just profit per hectare or margin per cows and things like that. Obviously, lifestyle high nature farming index or your carbon assessments or whatever and I, I think it would be an awful lot more easier for fellow farmers to sit down and look and see actually all right they're they might be making as much profit per hectare or whatever the case may be but they have a good lifestyle and they're doing what the land does and they're following the nature of the ground and oh he's they're on a heavy farm land we they've glazed same we have and they have a lot of water issues and things like that I think it would be very, very interesting and certainly an awful lot easier for farmers to see if, if, if that is done or that is accounted in some way through. Maybe it already is, but it certainly would be an awful lot easier for farmers to believe and to join this, this road. Okay, well, thanks very much. And we might put it back to the panel then taking Porrick's input, but, you know, the confusing um, scenario that, that you're faced with at the moment and, and Liam's point about, you know, the loss of traditional knowledge and the, the kind of common sense and need to bring it back. Would anybody like to yeah, respond think, to those or any other closing speaker, comments? The last speaker actually put it pretty well, you know. I think that we need to, unfortunately, we need to put a value on things nowadays. And, uh, you know, things like sanity, it's not a valued <laughs> commodity, <laughs> but uh, time, time is not a valued commodity. Uh, we're always talking about, you know, it always amazed me when, when I was a kid and, and the washing machine came along. Uh, I remember when people washed by hand and then the twin tub came. I don't know if anybody remembers the twin tub, but it was a pretty laborsome machine. And then along comes this wonderful self-loading, front-loading, whatever it was. We were supposed to save that time for something, but what do we do with it? We actually use that time to make more. And all of the things that we have done since, time, since, since the uh, Industrial Revolution and so forth to save us time so that we could have a better quality of life have been abused. And nobody has said, stop. If I'm going to save two hours, then I'll use that two hours to, I think it was, uh, uh, Carl Jung that said, you know, the proper balance is four hours of physical work, four hours of mental work, and the rest for God, whatever you want to call God, <laughs> nature. The great outdoors. The great outdoors, yeah. So I, I think all those balances, you know, need to be itemized. They need to be understood. They need to be, we need to be able to put them on paper so our young people can actually study them and say, what do I need? I mean, we have lots of people now that really need attention really, really need attention. That's what they're crying out for. And what do we do? We employ psychologists to tell them that they're this, this, and 
lacking in that or whatever. But really, they just need time and, and patience and somebody to be with them. So all of these things need to be commodified. And, and, uh, and as I say, people can look and make choices based on, on, on a far more parameters than we're using at the moment. British, would you like a, a You know, everything that was radical um, or considered radical, we now look and, and kind of go, it's kind of normal. You know, whether it was abolishing slavery, although I kind of think we never really got that one right, um, or, or woman getting the vote, or, or even the washing machine and, and, and the car, they were radical in their time. Um, and, and it becomes normal. So, I mean, I think one of the things we need to kind of say is when we start talking stuff that people say, she says, well, that's a bit radical now. It could be the new normal. So first of all, open that space up for that. But the second thing is, is that there very definitely is um, globally something really big going down, which is this move to kind of capture the food market, the seed market. Who's going to get the money out of feeding the world? You know, we talk about the need to feed the world and that's going to drive us, but who's going to kind of pick up the, the check or who's going to kind of get the, the profit from that? And, and it's very, very definitely, very clearly at this kind of stage, the, 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 the big world of industry or the little world of the farmer, you know? And at this stage, as I say, that's why the little world of the farmer is being squeezed out all over the place. Um, we don't have enough money to actually pay farmers properly to, to, to be on farm and land full time. But there is money for huge machinery and drones and precision agriculture and the, the, the type of stuff that somebody's going to have to take up massive debt for to farm in that manner. But you wouldn't be allowed to take up massive debt to pay yourself a really good salary to go and work on the land. You know, so there, there, there is this big struggle that's going down at the moment. We're seeing it around the food systems. Um, the Food Systems Summit. Uh, we're seeing it happening all over the place, and I think that we mustn't kind of kid ourselves. We've, you know, my, my great grandfather used to, kind of, um, great, great great uncle used to kind of say to me that if somebody came to take away his land, he would he would die fighting to keep it. But he's watching everybody else giving it away because they've been told it's worthless, so they believed them and they just ditched it. And I think that those are the type of things that are coming in. We need to, as I say, I think if we're learning anything from this thing today, it's about finding value. It's about finding value in ourselves. It's about finding value in the land. It's about finding value in what we produce. It's about finding, but we need to kind of find value again in, in people, in communities, in countries, feeding and looking after themselves and, 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 and doing it in a way that actually builds us up rather than tears us down. Great stuff, Bridges, Jared. Yeah, and I suppose um, what you, I suppose you started here in, in the burn, Brendan. Um, you know, from an Irish perspective, that type of uh, starting something and allowing it to grow and trying to then get it into the mainstream media where it's uh, communicated out to a broader group of people and the energy of that and the kind of the, the, the idea of that and the value that that sits around that 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 permeates into the the broader society because even in the context of what happened in the past like I think my own grandfather that I used to come down to in my Colin my he was seen as a, a really hard worker probably the hardest worker in in in, in the parish um, and but that, like, he spent a lot, he thought it was 11 in the family, and I'd say, uh, other than my father, my father was the lad that stayed behind because he, he didn't like school. He, he ended up going, joining the police, all right, and did well there, but all the others went to third level. So that was the way out of it. So the subsist my father had to run away from the subsistence level of farming because it was too hard on him as a person. The, the level of, of trying to make a living when, he'd, when if he wanted to go to a nightclub in Galway City to, to meet a girl or whatever, the only way he could do it was to, was to grow a few cabbages or whatever. He'd describe a story like, he'd describe a story of bringing a cartload of cabbages into Galway, trying to sell them in the fair in Galway. Now my father's 83, he's still alive, so this is early, late 40s, early 50s, when he was probably 54, 13 or 14, 15. He called on every hotel in Galway with the cabbages and uh, couldn't sell any of the cabbages, had to tip them into the cow dung heap outside the shed when he got home in the evening. So there was, if we look back on things, there wasn't always, there was plenty of hardship in it too. My, uh, you know, uh, and uh, so it's, it's trying to get the balance. Farming sits within the broader economic system. There's a drive of productivity within the broader, you know, any of us working in the corporate world work at a, are working harder and harder. 
Um, and uh, it's, it, there is that, bad, uh, uh, what, what Bridget is saying there about we all have a responsibility to understand what, because life is short, to understand time, to understand value, and to try and slow down um, and to try and take, take, take cognizance of the importance of, of life which, and, 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 and time and just the, the energy of, of, of being present. Um, and that all feeds into, that feeds right through, and, and from a farming, it sits in the middle of that. It's driven by, currently by, in, you know, the industrial systems that exist globally, um, but it's trying to come back into that, into that more right, balanced James, place. James, will we, do you want to close? Yeah, I think this, this leads I'll... in nicely into the, in, into the next section, like, you know, because we are coming back into how we actually value things, what we value within our, within our food system, and that's all linked to this concept of viability and sustaining rural communities and, and livelihoods as well. So yeah. I think it's, an, it's a nice place here to, to yeah. take a break. And I might, if I might just kind of, yeah. um, again, plug, I think, Thomas, you made a really interesting comment about this, this food as a commodity. Um, and I think we're possibly missing a trick. Now, some of us in the audience have been at it for years. Um, about putting a value on you know nutrient dense food and maybe that's a way um, to appeal to people's selfish nature because it has to grow nutrient dense food you need to you know be very sensitive to the land and to the environment and the time required and things like that so maybe there's a route in there but we'll be discussing that in detail in the afternoon um, I think you have three philosophers on the, <laughs> on the top table this morning. It's just fascinating listening to you guys. I could, I could, I could listen forever. I think it's really fascinating. But I think, it, like the session was um, supposedly about, um, you know, the practice and the sharing of knowledge around farming for nature and around sustainable farming. And I think what, what I learned from that this morning is, is, is often it, it's about kind of standing back and getting a sense of what your particular farm can give you and what your set of values are and, and responding to that and accessing information then from available resources. I know in the Burn program, the presence of a local office is really important, almost as a way to, to, to clear things so that the farmer can get on farming because farming has become very bureaucratic now in terms of permissions and paperwork and stuff like that. So our role is, is not even knowledge transfer, it's kind of making way so that the farmer can respond to his circumstances and, and to his needs. But I think the other side of things I'm a great believer in is, is that peer-to-peer -peer sharing. And that's really, I know Bridget and Lucy will agree with this, that's one of the main sort of purposes behind Farming for Nature and other great initiatives like Base Ireland and Knots and, uh, and, and so on. But it's, it's, it's giving um, the gentle voice of experience that a farmer often has and sharing that with others, um, not forcing it on them because they're not selling anything, but sharing that information. And when you think about it, going back in time, that's how people figured it out, isn't it? 50, 60 years ago by asking the neighbor who knew somebody who was doing something else. So maybe we need to revisit that and find ways to enable that to happen again somehow. So I think it's been a really fascinating morning and um, we're gonna take 15 minutes for a coffee break um, and a chat, and then we'll reconvene up here as well for part two, as James said, putting a value on what's really valuable. Um, so I'll see you in 15 minutes, thank you.